Hello, everybody. This is George N. Hughes, and this is The Bite Show. And we are blessed to have Joseph P. Farrell with us. And Joseph. Yes, (laughs) ma'am. I just finished reading Apocalypse Theater in one setting, and it is, oh, my God. Goodness, the information in that book is astounding. You mean Yahweh, the two-faced God? Yes. Uh huh. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, that's um, that's kind of the subject matter, I guess, that we're gonna that you wanted to talk about tonight. Um, yeah. It's you know first first I want to thank everybody for uh, supporting that book and you know the donations that everybody sent I, I truly am grateful and uh, we've had a good response this this is actually the third book that um, Dr. DeHart and I have written together and mm-hmm. it's it's based on largely on conversations that he and I've had over over the last 20 years um, like me he was he was in the church for quite some time um uh, in the Anglican Church, and uh, and worked for several years as a pastor and so on and so forth. So he's got that background as well uh, as me, and mm-hmm. uh, and is also like like me uh, uh, did his PhD at Oxford. So you know we have a lot of we have a lot of common yeah. ground, and and we wanted to write this book. It needed to be written. <laughs> well, yeah, we thought so. Um, you know, I've I've mentioned, and and he was going to be here tonight uh, for this first interview on it, and and you and I have set up hopefully something next week that yeah. we'll get him in on on the uh, interview as well, because mm-hmm. I think it's important for people to have not just my perspective of the book and and why we wrote it, but his as well, right? Uh, because you know, as as we mentioned in the preface to that book, that this is kind of the product of our thinking for about 20 years uh, yeah. having been involved with various versions of, of the Yahwist religions but anyway yeah it's it's crammed full of information <laughs> it's a short book but there's a lot of information in it oh my goodness yes there is <laughs> it is full of information I mean every sentence every paragraph you, you just hold your breath yeah, uh, yeah. It, it is an amazing book and so well documented, Joseph. Well, yeah, that was our that was our second uh, concern with this book. It's it's a different book in the sense that it's more of an essay of concepts than it is a, a real in depth study. Yeah. But nonetheless, we you know we wanted to document it and and give people resources in the bibliography that they yeah. could go to and, and consult. Uh, because most of the most of the books that we put in there are kind of off the beaten track, right? And there's reasons for that. Um, but but the book the book has a critique of of Yahwism from the moral standpoint, from from you know just about every standpoint that you can think of, and then it it ends as you know with with <laughs> a totally unexpected curveball. Yeah. Oh. Well, why do you call it Yahweh, the two-faced God? All right. Uh, the first reason is, George Ann, and it's something you and I have talked about. I know that you've interviewed others and, and pointed out this problem. Yeah. The Yahwist religions have an inherent moral contradiction. Oh, yes, they do. <laughs> uh, you know, and to put it in a nutshell, and, and Scott's much better at, at doing this sort of thing than I am, but, but to put it in a nutshell... The reason why we call it the two-faced God is, first of all, there is a Roman god in, in the old Roman pantheon called Janus. Mm-hmm. And Janus is always depicted as being a two-faced god, one face looking one direction and the other face looking in exactly the opposite direction. Yes. And in the Roman mythology, Janus was the god of the new year, you know, looking back on the old year, looking forward to the new year, so on and so forth. But we thought it was a perfect sort of image to conjure for the moral contradiction that is within all Yahwist religions, be it Judaism, Christianity, Islam. 
And the reason why is that if you go back to the Old Testament, to the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, or the Torah, as, as the Jews call it, if you go back to those five books, the whole Yahwist tradition comes out of the character of Yahweh as it's depicted in those books. Yes. All right? And then, of course, you get the later books in the, in the Old Testament with the prophets and the writings, and then on into the New Testament with Christianity, you get yet a further fleshing out of, of that character. Mm-hmm. Well, the character is basically morally schizophrenic. Yeah. If, you know, and, and I, I'm taking a long time around Harvey's barn to answer this question because, in a certain sense, my part of, of this book... I wanted people to view it within my larger output, all right? Mm -hmm. So we have two approaches we can take to the character of Yahweh. The The first approach is that we can assume that there was a real character that the stories are based upon. Yes. That there's some individual running around way back when uh, proclaiming to be the creator God and positioning himself in a a particular relationship with the ancient Hebrew people and so on and so forth. Or we can take the view of some biblical scholars and even some people within the independent research community that the character of Yahweh and the stories are the invention of a hidden elite. Uh Uh-huh. All right. You can take either approach. Yeah. All right. But in the end, the moral schizophrenia remains. And what's the moral schizophrenia? Well, it's this. On the one hand, we have within the the Old Testament, we have, and particularly within the Pentateuch, we have Yahweh proclaiming that he really loves the Hebrews and so on and so forth, all right? Mm-hmm. And on the other hand, this guy is is not only slaughtering the Hebrews for the slightest little infraction yeah. of you know his justice or whatever, but slaughtering everybody else in, in the path of yeah. the Hebrews, you know. Yeah. So you know, it's it's the case. It's the case if you if you look at Yahweh in in terms of the modern context or the modern situation, it's the case of an abusive parent. Uh, a terribly, uh, not only a physically abusive parent, but an emotionally abusive parent. Yes. You know, I love you, you know, I knock you around for your own good, and, you know, I yell and scream and give you these emotional abuses. And that's the first reason we wrote it, is is to shock people into realizing that no matter what your theological explanation for this behavior may be, in the end... In the end, none of us would behave that way to anyone else. None of us would view such behavior on the part of anyone else as being moral. Right. And, you know, at this juncture, this is something that that Dr. DeHart and I discussed for years and years and years because he and I both went through what what can only be called a kind of personal hell at, yeah. at the hands of, of the churches that we were trying to serve. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I won't go into his story, and I won't go into mine. It's neither here nor there. Because the ultimate net effect of, of what we had each experienced was it caused us really to question what really is going on. Why is this behavior not something that is occasional or exceptional but why does it seem to be endemic to the institutions themselves well the reason it's endemic is that it's right there it's it's part of the character of yahweh it's part of the so-called special revelations attached to that character from the outset ab initio so in other words you can you can dress and tailor up the system as much as you want to but that moral contradiction is always going to be there and at some point if you accept the programming, and that's what I think it is, if you accept the programming, then that will manifest itself in behavior of some sort that is going to be equally morally contradictory. Yes. Now, when I say that, I, I fully realize, you know, some people are going to say, well, everybody has moral contradictions of one sort or another in their life. Yes, that's true. But none of us are claiming on the basis of that moral contradiction to be God. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> see, that's, that's the problem. Yeah. And, you know, the other, the other thing we point out in, in the first couple of chapters of the book, as you're aware, is that this whole paradigm is placed within the context of a much wider thing going on in the ancient world. And we've yeah. talked about this as, as long ago as, as the Cosmic War series. Yes. That there is an ancient metaphor of the physical medium. There is an ancient metaphor of God. And you find that metaphor, we talk about it uh, in Grid of the Gods, you find that metaphor everywhere from the Vedas in India to the Popol Vuh of the Mayas in, in Central America. You find it within the Hermetic tradition from Egypt. You find it within the Neoplatonic tradition. There is everywhere you turn, there is some idea of this metaphor and some sort of primordial trinity that results from the first division that occurs within the physical medium, mm-hmm. all right? Mm-hmm. The Hindus call it Krishna and Shiva and Brahma, and uh, the Neoplatonists called it one noose and, and world soul, or one intellect and world soul. The Christians call it Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, the Mayans have uh, Father Sky, Mother Earth, and, and the common boundary between the two. Whatever it is, you've got some sort of Trinitarian scheme at yeah. work. Now, that metaphor is, as I've pointed out in, in numerous books, beginning back in the Philosopher's Stone, what even, in fact, way back in, in the Giza, Death Star Destroyed, that metaphor isn't dependent so much on, on faith in a religious sense. It's more like faith in the sense of a, a mathematical proposition. You know, given this, then if this is so, then what follows from it, all right? Yeah. Now, Yahwism comes along, and as we point out in the first two chapters, we take a great deal of time to point out that any form of revealed monotheism, which, you know, basically means Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, mm-hmm. uh, there, there are other forms of revealed monotheism in, in uh, India, Jainism, and so on and so forth, yeah. but we're not so much concerned with, with non-Yahwist traditions. The Yahwist traditions define themselves in the first five books of the Old Testament in opposition to that metaphor. Hmm. In other words, the Exodus becomes their founding revolutionary violent moment, and Egypt becomes the symbol for all that is past and all that is rejected. In other words, Egypt becomes the symbolism for any culture adhering to that ancient metaphor. Hmm. Follow me? Yes. And Yahwism, as such, is thus, by defining itself in opposition to a previous tradition that is more or less worldwide, what Yahwism is doing is it's defining itself in a very peculiar fashion, Georgian, it's defining itself as kind of a counter-religion. It's defining itself, if you look at it from the standpoint of the metaphor, it's defining itself as an anti-religion. Uh-huh. And once, once, you, once you see this, once you understand that the founding moment of, of Yahwism, in any of its versions, Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, is in fact the Exodus, is in fact the special revelation that God gives to Moses alone on a mountaintop, all right? Mm-hmm. Once, you, once you see it in that sense, then you, then you realize that this, this central moment, this defining moment in the religious tradition itself is an act of revolutionary violence. Oh, ho, ho. So in other words, you set up a paradigm that has been true ever since in its secular forms, you have Nazism with with its founding moment with the Beer Hall Putsch, which of course again was a violent moment. You have the Communists defining their their so-called revolutionary break with the past, with the October Revolution in 1917. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have the the fascists in Italy with the March on Rome in 1922. You have the Long March in Communist China in 1949. But the paradigm is all coming out of this idea that a system can define itself in opposition to all else in an act of revolutionary violence. And the first example of this, of claiming a divine status for a system, is the Exodus. It's Moses. 
So yeah, this this is this is the primary reason we wrote that book because we we wanted people to see that there are certain implicit assumptions within these traditions that you simply cannot get rid of. Yeah. You can you can try all the theological explanations that you want, but the bottom line is this is how they were founded and therefore there's always going to be an implicit undercurrent of violence within any of those traditions and they it will surface from time to time regardless of what you do to to try and get rid of it as long as you accord a kind of divine canonical status to whatever text it is that you take as revealed truth be it the old testament or the old and new testament with christianity or the quran with islam mm-hmm. you're you're going to be dealing with systems founded in acts of violence that is their defining feature. They have been founded in opposition to all that preceded them. Oh. And even, you know, Christianity, uh, people may object that, that the founding there is, is in an act of revolutionary violence. Well, no, it's not. It's it's the crucifixion and, yes. and, and, and uh, the resurrection and all of the theological justifications or, or lack thereof that have been given throughout history for that particular act and as you know in in grid of the gods we pointed out that that there's a kind of sacrificial logic at work within some versions of christianity to explain that oh yeah Yeah. so yeah uh that's (laughs) i took a long time around harvey's barn again to answer that one question (laughs) oh joseph oh oh my goodness well I, i see a lot of similarities between the muslim religion and Christianity. For example, yes. the Muslims, uh, you have complete subjection. Yes. And in Christianity, you have absolute obedience. Right. You right. Know, um, there are parallels, George Ann. This is, this is another good point that you're raising. Uh, the parallels with these types of Yahweh's traditions, the first thing that we have to understand is that when we're dealing with with what these religions really are, mm-hmm. in in the standpoint of what preceded them in world culture. Yeah. Well, from this standpoint, those earlier religions were nature religions by and large. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've spent a great deal of time in my various books pointing out that that these ancient cultures were organizing their philosophical religious systems around a residue of a lost science. Yeah. All right, and that therefore their temples and so on and so forth were embodiments of heavenly motions of, you know, the what they considered to be the movements or motions of the gods and so on and so forth. But yeah. the bottom line was was that these things were kind of uh to, in a certain sense, they were kind of open-ended systems because they were at at root religions of nature, if you want to call them religions at all. Yeah. And therefore, anybody could understand it. Yes. Uh, you know, the modern the modern equivalent to what these ancient cultures were would be the rise of modern science. Um, there's, you know, the parallels are oftentimes quite astonishing when you look at them. And, and that's been kind of the burden of, of my work on, on the ancient uh, series of books, is to show that these ancient religions were preserving a residue of scientific truth that when you take modern science and then look back at these ancient religions, you're kind of astonished at, at what you find. Yes. But the Yahweh's tradition does something very different. By defining itself in opposition to what had preceded it, yes. namely Egypt. All right, mm-hmm. Egypt again being the big symbol of that world culture: yeah. idolatry, paganism, darkness. You know the whole the whole nine yards. When you when you look at it in that way, the Yahwist religions replace nature with, and here it comes, with a book. Yeah. Because by the nature of their claims, you must not only believe the message you must believe the messenger yeah <laughs> so in other words you you are put in immediately and i we've spoken about this in foster swastikas and psyops yeah with the similarity that claimants to abductions and 
contact with aliens have. Because, again, the contactees in UFO literature are always bearers of a message. Yes. They're bearers of a revelation. Yes. And I pointed out that even with George Adamski, you have a parallel with, you know, not only Moses going up on the mountain and getting his private message from a superior being, you have the same thing with Mohammed. Mm-hmm. All right? So you are put in the position where you must not only believe the message, but you must believe the messenger and his successors. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> so in other words, the very nature of Yahweh's tradition is is that it does three things. Number one, it empowers a messenger. And this is why I opened the, the first question by saying that, you know, regardless of whether you take Yahweh as a real being, a real character, or an elite making up a story, mm-hmm. the net effect is the same. Because you must not only believe the message, you must believe the messenger and the elite established to interpret that special message in perpetuity. Yes. So you have astonishing parallels, George Ann, between the authority structure of classical historical Christianity. And please understand, I don't mean the modern American evangelical Baptist version. All yeah, right. Yeah. That's kind of that's kind of the end result of, of Yahwism version 2.0, all right? Yeah. But within classical historical Christianity, be it Eastern Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism, Anglicanism, uh, even even some of the more uh, ritualistic Protestant churches like Lutheranism or Presbyterianism, you have, first of all, the authority of the Scripture itself, the book, mm-hmm. which is to be interpreted. And then you have the authority of the elite doing the interpreting. Yes. All right? And, of course, they're not going to interpret in any other fashion that other than to maintain their own authority to do so. Right. (laughs) Okay? That's where that obedience part comes in. Yeah. Well, you know, so you've got a structure of, of, of a text or a book or a scripture then you have an elite, and then you have the third component of this, which is the tradition of interpretation that's been given throughout history to certain key passages. Yeah. Well, that's true in Christianity. If you look at Islam, it has exactly the same structure, because you've got the text, you've got an authoritative elite, and the imams, mm-hmm. who are schooled in the the Muslim uh, hadith, which is their their form of tradition. In other words, it's what has been the consensus of interpretation of the Quran in the past. Yeah. And that's the key word, consensus. Yes. You must march in lockstep with the infallible consensus, or you are outside the pale. Yeah. You and we it. see this over and over, not only within the history of Islam, we see it within the history of, of medieval Catholicism in the West, you know, with the Inquisition and roasting people alive if they fought outside the box. Yeah. To, you know, Lutherans and Calvinists dunking Anabaptists in the lake with weights on, you know, on their feet so that, you know, they, they had a permanent baptism if they fell outside the, the consensus of, of Lutheran or Calvinist orthodoxy. Oh my. You saw it in, in communism, you know, if people were not following the orthodox communist line, then off we go to a psychiatric hospital because they're being irrational. Mm-hmm. You know, on and on this goes. Yeah. It's, it's the, the, Enshrinement of an authoritative text, be it the Bible, be it the Quran, be it Mein Kampf, be it Das Kapital. You know? yeah. <laughs> this, this system and its opposites, and, and please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying Nazism or Communism are Yahweh's traditions, but since they're mirror secular images of Yahwism, they are bound to reproduce a similar sort of authority structure, and yeah. that's exactly what they did. So, you know, you've got your sacred text, you've got your elite doing the interpreting, and then you've got the infallible consensus. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, oh. Yeah, there's your, there's your obedience. Mm. And, you know, if you, start, if you start straying outside the line, then they send you, you know, a brother or a sister, quote-unquote, to counsel you, yeah. you know, and so on and so forth. In other words, they play the guilt game to the hilt. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, Joseph. It's it's insidious, Georgia. Yes, it is. It is. And I hope people can see this. I do, too. 
you know, I think... It's, it's, it, let me... Uh, hold your thought for a minute. Okay. It's, the reason why I, I say I hope they do, too, is because we have, and we talk about this uh, in the Yahweh book, we have a group within this country of evangelicals that are so dead sure of their interpretation of biblical prophecy mm -hmm. that no matter what they will support a particular country in the Middle East. Yeah. Because not to do so conflicts with their system of interpretation. Yeah, yeah. So it becomes morally impossible to look objectively at the policies of said country and the surrounding countries, for that matter, with any objectivity. Yes. Because the system must be maintained. Oh. Now, this is, to my mind, George Ann, this is a tailor-made situation for a self-fulfilling prophecy, for a self-fulfilling apocalyptic prophecy, oh, when absolutely. it need not be. And, and Dr. DeHart and I took a lot of time in that book, as you know, to point out that the origins of this particular teaching within modern American evangelicalism are no earlier than the 19th century. <laughs> yeah. And for good reason, because the people supporting the spread of of that particular doctrine mm -hmm. were connected with big oil. Yeah. Were connected with big banks. Yep. The people promoting the doctrine had dubious moral character and they managed to get their dubious interpretations of biblical prophecy published by none other than the Oxford University Press. Oh my god. <laughs> so, you, know, you don't and that 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 should set off alarm bells for people too. And I'm of course referring to Cyrus Schofield and, and the Rapture Doctrine and the Schofield Reference Bible and all of the Tal Lindsay esque speculations that have yeah. been going on ever since then. Yeah. Well, as I said, that whole doctrine is nowhere found within any classical Christian tradition whatsoever. Right. It's not found within Orthodoxy, it's not found within Roman Catholicism, it's not found within Lutheranism, it's not found within Presbyterianism or Anglicanism, and there's the key. Yeah. The Anglican Church, of course, had tremendous influence over the Oxford University Press in the 19th century. So why would would a press be publishing a version of the Bible with, with notes on how to interpret things correctly, oh, which is diametrically in, in conflict with Christian tradition, yeah. unless someone wanted that interpretation to spread? Yeah, an agenda. An agenda, precisely. So, you know, I want to wake people up before, you know, and, and really get them to thinking and dig deep. And that, that was my motivation for, for writing this book. And I'm, I'm pretty certain that next week, if we can get Dr. DeHart up here to uh, talk about the book as well, I, I'm pretty certain you'll find that, that he's in four square agreement with that. Um, yeah. That, that there was an agenda in play mm -hmm. to promote this doctrine because it dovetails very neatly with the geopolitical designs of, of Western elites. Oh, boy. Yeah, oh, oh, oh boy. Uh. Yeah, ugh. Anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that's <laughs> that okay. That was another yeah. long dance around Harvey's barn. That's okay. Well, you know, a thousand times I've been told, oh, you speak out against Israel, God will curse you. Uh -huh. uh, you know... That's a bunch of baloney. Well, it's a bunch of baloney from two standpoints. As I said, in classical Christian doctrine, and we've we've discussed this a long, long time ago, the the sacrifice of Christ yes. was understood mm -hmm. to be, of course, since it was the you know in, in classical Christian teaching, since it was the death of God the Son Himself. Yeah. This was the perfect, all-sufficient sacrifice for all times, places, races, conditions of men. Yes. Anywhere. Yes. Anywhere. At any time. Yes. And thus, as, as the early church interpreted it, that abolished once and for all, never to be replaced by any other system, that abolished once and for all the distinction between Jew and Gentile, and therefore all of those Old Testament promises and curses were fulfilled in Christ. Yeah. 
so therefore to say, and, and in the thinking of the early church fathers, the church thus became the new Israel. So the secular state of Israel has nothing whatsoever to do with what classical Christian doctrine teaches. Yeah. You can examine it and, and call into question its policies all you want, and you're not under some sort of divine curse for doing so. That's, right. That's the bottom line of, of classical Christian doctrine. But in the other sense, as we point out in the book, the, the Zionist movement within the 19th and early 20th centuries is an entirely secular movement. Yes. And, you know, most people are not aware that it is not part of Orthodox Jewish teaching that, you know, human efforts are going to restore Israel and then the Messiah comes. It's the other way around. It's yeah. Yeah. classical Jewish teaching. Yes. And, you know, the early Zionist leaders caught flack from, you know, justifiably so, from Orthodox rabbis who, who were looking at, at this political movement with a great deal of skepticism. Right. Uh, you know, as being a misrepresentation of, of the Jewish faith. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's true on that score. <laughs> you know, just in the secular sense. So, yeah, you know, people, this is why I keep telling people, wake up and get your noses out of that dang book and start thinking. Yes. Because if you don't, you may very well be fulfilling the apocalypse, but not in a way that you, you know, you are thinking is a good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think you're going to get uh, snatched out of this world and avoid all the suffering, think again. We <laughs> Because, you well, know, as I said, that doctrine is 19th century. Yeah. You know, I don't understand how people can think that you know that they that God needs help. That, well, yes. You know that that He needs help in uh, building Israel, and I take Israel as meaning twelve tribes, not necessarily the modern the, nation state. Right. 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 Well, again, you know, you're taking a rational historical view of things, and this. This is entirely what we're trying to accomplish in the book, is, is to put a lot of controversial information out there in the hope that it will wake some people up. We, obviously, we know that there's a certain class of, of fundamentalists in all three versions of, of Yahwism. Uh, Joseph, there's no difference between fundamentalist Christian and fundamentalist Muslim. Well, it's interesting that you say that, because one of the sources, we, we only quote him once, but in doing so, we're hoping to wake people up. Uh, a fellow by the name of John Rusus Rushdoni, yeah. who is a, was, I should say, he's since passed away, but um, was a Calvinist promulgator of what's called dominionism, mm -hmm. all right? Or sometimes it's called the theonomy movement, which is from the Greek word theos, which of course is God, and then nomos, which means law. In other words, God's mm -hmm. law. So you have this kind of Calvinist tradition of, <laughs> one of a better expression, uh, of a kind of Christian Sharia law, mm -hmm. because they think it would just be peachy keen to go back to, a, you know, in their understanding, a, a Christian theocracy where Old Testament law is the guiding light for forming the laws of human society. Oh, gee. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can sit down and read Rushtoni's Institutes of Biblical Law, which is this huge tome, yeah. and he thinks it's just great that the Massachusetts Bay Colony at one period in its history had laws against children striking their parents, which was punishable but with the death penalty. Oh, my God. Based on Old Testament law. Oh. And, you know, he points triumphantly to the fact, well, needless to say, there weren't very many children striking their parents in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Yeah. Well, yeah, but by the same token, do we want to sell our daughters into slavery? You know, do do we want to institute all of that? This is, this is the medievalism. This is the barbarism of these kinds of people. Mm -hmm. And, again, it goes back to this inherent moral contradiction that if you or I to, were to behave that way, Justifiably, yeah. we'd be hauled up to a court. Oh yeah. <laughs> you, know? you discipline a child, 
uh, spank their little butt for doing something, and you're probably going to have the child taken away from well, you. Well, there's that problem too. I'm, you know, I'm certainly not in favor of rampant secularism by any stretch of the imagination. Right. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that you've got, as you say, you've got a a group or a segment within American evangelicalism that thinks this way. Yeah. And, you know, they've written books, <laughs> you know, published by the Presbyterian and Reformed Publishing Company. Oh, dear. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's not just Muslims talking this way, folks. Uh, you better wake up and understand this. You've, you've got the same phenomena in all three versions of Yahwism. You've got this fundamentalist reaction against the modern world and where mm-hmm. it's going. And uh, it's, you know, the divide between the two, I think, is only going to increase. Yes, I can see that. You know, I'm wondering what the difference is between a Muslim strapping a bomb on and a Christian that believes uh, that killing the opposition is okay. None. Morally, there's none. Right. Morally, there's none. And, you know, we spent a a good deal of time in the second chapter of that book pointing out that there is a certain segment, because of this abominable rapture doctrine and all of its consequences, um, there's a certain segment of that community that actually looks forward to the apocalypse. Yes, and they don't realize... And they don't realize what they're really looking forward to. Exactly. Yeah, it's it again, and that's a manifestation of that moral schizophrenia. Yeah, it's 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 the old logic that is used within the UFO community that many Christians point out as being a reprehensible logic. In that, in the UFO community, the contactees or abductees will often rationalize the behavior of the so-called aliens that they're in touch with. And I'm not here to debate whether, you know. They're having real experiences with aliens or demons or whatever. I'm, I'm not here to debate that. I'm simply pointing out the paradigm. Yeah. And the paradigm is that, well, these aliens, you know, must be advanced beings because they have all of this wonderful technology, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And therefore, we can't really expect their behavior to be the same as ours. So, in other words, the appeal is to a higher morality to, ju- to justify what is otherwise immoral behavior. Yeah. Well, what do you got with Yahwism? Is same thing. Same thing. But people can't see it because... But people can't see it because they've got their heads buried in a book. Yeah. They think that if you question these things, that you're questioning belief in God, and that's our point. Belief in God was around a long time before, before. Yahweh. Yes, exactly. Exactly, Joseph. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. I think, you know, I think toward the end of the book we we cite um, Graham Hancock and Robert Boval, mm-hmm. who made the very trenchant mm-hmm. observation that if we're to avoid the situation that the world is now getting itself into, yeah. then God has to go their way. And then Dr. DeHart and I added the codicil, it's not so much God, it's simply that you have to decouple the notion of Yahweh from God. Yes. Yes. And let's remember that the early Gnostics, for all of their philosophical problems, and there were many of them, don't get me wrong, but the one problem they had with Yahweh was precisely this moral contradiction. Yes. And the inability to reconcile that with what their version of this ancient metaphor was saying about God, or the Supreme Being, or the Creator, or the Great Intellect, whatever name that they chose to give it. Uh, that's the problem. <laughs> it's a huge, huge thing, George Ann. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, you know, neither Dr. DeHart nor I are trying to question people's faith or people of faith. Right. That's not the point. Right. The point is to question the system. Yes. And that's the point. Yeah, the system. Yes, indeed. Oh, 
Oh, yes, and it needs to be questioned. Because, Joseph, I think that we're heading off in a very barbaric future. Um, and it need not be. Right. right. It need not be. Right. It need not be. You know, the, the classical question is, all right, if God told you to go murder someone because they're Amalekites, yeah, or Muslims, or, your or Christians, or your neighbor, or Christians, yeah. or what you know, or Jews, mm-hmm. would you? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> but you see, that's that's the inherent contradiction because Yahwism, at some point in all three versions, has done just, just that. that. Yes. Yep. Oh my God. <laughs> Oh, Joseph. Yeah, it's it's a huge thing, George Ann, and you know, I can only hope and pray that people will understand what we're trying to do. Well, you know, at various times in various interviews, I've asked people, uh-huh. if God told you to go kill your neighbor, would you? Yeah. And the the answer is typically no. <laughs> well, yeah. I've had I've I've posed the same question, George Ann, on a number of occasions to different people. Yeah. And in one instance, I got a re- the immediate response, "Well, yes." Oh my. And then gosh. the person thought for a minute. Well, no. Okay. Well, if it's no, then you're questioning the system. Mm-hmm. And if it's yes, then you've got blind obedience to that system. Yes. And. This is the problem, because we've got now, <clears throat> within all three versions of Yahwism, we've got now, in the modern world, fundamentalist movements within them yes. that are championing precisely that reaction to the modern world. Oh, my God. And the point is, folks, these, in their original revelations, if, if you look at the latest version of it, which is Islam, the latest version then comes around about seven, six or seven hundred A.D. Mm-hmm. All right. So we're dealing, even in the latest version, with something medieval. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in all of the, all of the worst ways. Yeah. So you know, uh, I, I can't I can't see the rationality. Yeah. Well. People say, what the hell is he talking about? We have dishwashers and and vacuum cleaners and 20th century stuff. What does he mean, medieval? You know, I can just hear it. (laughs) Oh, yes. Well, you know, we we cite from a a fellow by the name of Chris Hedges, and I know you have a a statement of him up on the front page of your website. I have high respect for him. I do, too. I do, too. And he puts it very bluntly. You know, as long as you maintain the canonicity of these texts yes. in all of their variegated schizophrenia. Yeah. As long as you maintain that view, then you're going to have these types of, of reactions. So, in other words, uh, you know, he comes about as close as to saying that the churches, in particular, have to get their act together and go back and really re-examine the basis on which they were were proclaiming canonicity. Yes. Uh, and I think he's absolutely right, because uh-huh. as long as that happens, it doesn't happen, I should say, then the moral problem remains. Well, some people would say, Joseph, that they need scary stuff in order to keep the people in line. Sure, that's you know that's one of the that's one of the techniques that is used within these religions. You know, I saw it personally, George Ann. I oh. saw this tactic used at a seminary that I used to teach at. Oh dear! And used by the people in authority at that seminary, and they were literally screaming. I, I remember this very vividly. They were literally literally screaming at the students. Oh. You know, if you do this or show any signs of that, you know, we will root you out. I remember it ringing in my ears. Yeah. And, oh. you know, the scare tactics are there. The the guilt manipulation is there. Yeah. Uh, all, of the, all of it. Oh. All of it. Oh, my God. Oh, Joseph. <laughs> it, you know, this is, the other, this is the other thing that we try and make clear in the book. The... The, 
Yahmist religions take that metaphor, and we spend a great deal of time going over that metaphor in the book so that people understand its implications and understand implications of rejecting it. Yeah. The Yahmist religions take that metaphor, which is a cosmological sort of philosophical viewpoint, mm -hmm. and they transform that metaphor into a technique of social engineering. The only thing that has ever been the result of that technique has been endless division. Yes. You have divisions within Judaism that are very apparent even by the time of the New Testament between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You have divisions within Christianity. I mean, my word, just look at the history of Christianity since the Protestant Reformation. It's been endless division. Thousands. With ev thousands. You know, every yeah. every preacher who has a Bible is now on an automatic authority on some special truth that only he and his special interpretation have. Yeah. So it's been endless division. And the same within Islam. You have the division between the Shias and the Sunnis. Mm -hmm. And on and on and on and on and on it goes. Even within communism, you know, the famous secular counterpart, you've got the divisions between the Stalinists and the Trotskyites. You know, oh. on and on this goes. Oh, my God. And oh. if you look long and hard enough, you'll find that there are divisions within Nazism in the her early history of Nazism between, you know, Hitler and, and, and uh, I think it was Steiner. I forget what his name was. Rudolf Steiner? Not Rudolf Steiner, no, someone else. Oh. But, you know, over and over again, this, these systems produce division, they produce bloodshed, because oh. anyone anyone who thinks outside the system is ipso facto, by their own definition, an infidel, an idolater, an apostate, a heretic, what have you. Mm -hmm. You dare not challenge the system. <laughs> Yeah, it's like you can't beat City Hall. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. And it's really time for people to wake up. My word. We're in the 21st century, and you're right. We do have dishwashers and televisions and computers and hydrogen bombs. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and we want to let these religions determine the future of the world. Oh, well, in each of these religions, the future that they all envision, is apocalypse, is annihilation. Yeah. Oh, how happy. <laughs> and oh, how happy, because finally our system will be vindicated as the one and only truth. <laughs> and, and, they, and they think that it's okay, Joseph, because they'll all be resurrected. Oh, yeah, they'll all, you know, they'll all have their, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just don't see it. I... I well, I don't either. That's the point. You know, the, they begin in a division yeah. by defining themselves in opposition to something that preexisted them. So look what you have. You have a division in the social space. Yes. You have a division in the temporal space. Yeah. You have within the individual psyche of the individual believer in any one of these three systems, you know, any human being of any conscience whatsoever is going to have some misgivings about some aspect of them. So there's an internal division. Yeah. A, a perpetual warfare within, so to speak. Yeah. Oh, I haven't had enough faith, you know, I've got to I've gotta run off and join Opus Day and wear spiked belts, you know. Yeah, and, and and wear a, wear you know, wear these belts all the time and be celibate for the rest of my life or pack myself off to a monastery to live the angelic life or what have you. Yeah. You know. But the bottom line is is you have all of these divisions that are created as a result of of system. And the result of that is very important because in order each of them claiming to be the absolute revealed truth, right? Yeah. Well, the problem is there are other systems out there. That's reality. So each of these systems, each of the Yahwisms, has has their own version of the apocalypse when their system alone finally triumphs. And is, is, so to speak, proven true by, and this is always the key word, by blunt, brute force. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, in the book of Revelation, uh, there is no difference between the rise of uh, the Ahmadi and the rise of Christ. Um the yeah. only difference is the timing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, my God. Oh, oh Can we pause a minute? Yes. We're back. Joseph? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah, is the it is the timing. Yes, yes. Um, and people don't see that either. No, no. And, and they see these so-called prophecies as being set in stone. Yes. Uh, which I don't. I don't see them set in stone. Well, the, yes, precisely so. This is the other problem that we try and point out in the book is that the inherent tendency of any notion of prophecy in the Yahwist sense is always going to involve elements of self-fulfillment. Yeah. In other words, prophecies are as much capable of, be, uh, of being manipulated by elites yes. for their own purposes. Mm-hmm. And, again, the purpose ultimately, of course, is the triumph of the system over all others opposing it. And it's always in the future. And it's always in the future. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh. Future, future, future. Well, you know, it, it's tailor-made for the current geopolitical situation mm-hmm. and for the manipulations of elites to manipulate that situation. So, oh, yeah. So, you know, again, wake up. <laughs> oh, Joseph, I hope and I pray that people I do too. will get this book and read it. It is packed with information. Yeah, that, that, that everybody that calls themselves a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew needs to read this book. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, I've commented many times before in these interviews, George Ann, that there are Muslim scholars yes. that have been pointing out that one of the biggest problems with their culture is the fact that their religion has not been through any similar sort of movement like the Reformation. In other words, it remains, of all three versions of Yahwism, it's the most locked into a kind of fundamentalist mindset. Yeah. And we've seen the attempts within the Muslim world to to create secular states yeah. to try and move away from that. Well, as we've seen, the, the Western elites are busily trying to dismantle those states and, and reinstall... Uh, for want of a better expression, Islamist regimes. Well, yes. I think there's a reason for that, and that is that those regimes will keep that part of the world backward. Yeah. And you know, uh, I don't think I don't think the desire for love and freedom beats any less within the Arab breast than it does within anyone else's. Um, right. You know, I, I just don't. <laughs> right. My gosh. Oh. Yeah. They they want freedom. They want um, the freedom to express themselves. Uh, and what's wrong with that? Well, you know, the Western world took a long time to free itself mm-hmm. from the tyranny of the papacy, to free itself from basically the kind of, of fundamentalist tyrannies that, that used religion as an excuse. Yeah. To, to get rid of people that were thinking outside of its box. Yeah. And as a result, we've we've created a, a kind of a new thing in terms of world history. Yeah. But the sad thing is, is that we see these things on the rise. Uh, you know, and that, that to me is very frightening. Yes. Yes, it is. Well, how long ago was... Um was it that the Old Testament existed actually in a cohesive form? Well, that's really that's really a very intricate, involved proposition. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, you have within biblical scholarship, you had beginning about 1750, the rise of of biblical criticism, which was a kind of scholarship that began to question the traditional dating and and assumptions of the compositions of the Old Testament, and particularly of of the first five books of the Old Testament. Yeah. Um, hopefully, 
and and that dating basically was codified circa the year 1840 to 1850 with with the so-called Graf Wellhausen hypothesis, mm -hmm. which is kind of a long involved thing to try and describe here. But basically, the the assumption of those critics by that time was that that the Old Testament, particularly the, the first five books of the Bible, dated to circa the year 621 A.D. In other words, they redated things to about a thousand years after the events that are actually described. Uh -huh. Now, counter to that, you have within conservative uh, evangelicalism, you have a different move within biblical scholarship that has attempted to more or less to defend the mosaic authorship of, of the first five books of the Bible and and to date them roughly coterminous with the events being described. Mm -hmm. um, I think personally, and and I'm speaking only for myself here. I'm not speaking for Doctor DeHart. Um, he and I have, he and I have discussed this at at great length in the last twenty years, and, and particularly as we were writing this book and, and laying out future projects, we are hoping at some point in these series of e-books to address some of those types of issues, oh, good. but in a very different manner. Because while you have this going on within biblical scholarship, you have within the independent research community a very, very different approach to these questions. It's very little known. Uh, it's almost the Christian apologists uh, in this country are almost completely unaware that this body of work even exists. Oh, <laughs> but, but there's a group out there of researchers that are approaching this whole question just simply out of left field, mm -hmm. and what they're doing is redating, in some cases, redating the books of the Bible even earlier than conservative Christian scholarship, and in other cases are saying that the whole thing top to bottom, from Old Testament to New Testament, is the creation of an elite. In other words, you know, that, that the events, the people are entirely concocted, and yeah. that the books are codes for other things. And... Well, that even though that sounds even though that sounds very very uh, crazy at first hearing, when you actually read what they're saying and why they're saying it, it's not it's not so crazy. Yeah, that so, may be true. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're hoping at some point to to do something about these types of questions, not not in the sense of resolving them certainly, but at least laying them out there and, and perhaps suggesting a few... Examining them. Uh, yeah, examining them and perhaps suggesting a few possible avenues yeah. of, of approach to it. So, yeah, it's that's a huge question, Georgian, and, and um, it's it's so huge, you know, that, that, and I've said it before in some of these interviews, it's so huge that it would literally require me to uh, assemble a vast research library and devote at least two to three years nonstop to doing research and, and starting to write about it. It's it's so huge. Um, oh my goodness. Yeah, it, it it's a huge huge thing. Oh my goodness, Joseph. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's possible that it's true in part. Right. Um, I think uh, that. That needs to be looked at significantly. Yes. Um, because there are kind of clues. <laughs> right. <laughs> in the text. That oh yes, there are. There are. You know that uh, lead one that studies these things to understand it. Right. Right. My personal view is, um, and again, I'm speaking only for myself, not Dr. Hart here. Right. My my personal view is, George Ann, that we cannot <clears throat> reconstruct the actual history of these texts from within a position that accords any sort of uh, revealed truth 
to the to the claims of Yahwism. In other words, I don't think an objective history can be written by someone from within those traditions examining those texts. Right. Now, of course, they will argue the other otherwise that you can't write an objective history outside of them either. No. Um, and you know that that argument's been going on for you know, ever since the rise of biblical criticism for the last 250 years or so. Yeah. But uh, my reason for saying that is is that like any other text from ancient times, you're dealing with a very very complex phenomenon. And if you take the view that Yahwism is a counter religion, defining itself in opposition to the surrounding cultures then there are reasons for that. It, you know, viewed a certain way, that means that, that it's a power play. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to look at it from that point of view. So, you know, anything, anything that he and I were to write about that is going to be attacked by a certain group of people. Oh, it's going yeah. to be, you know, it's going to be lauded by another group of people. And, and in both cases, I think you, you miss the point. Um, yeah. Yep. Oh. Yeah. You know, I just finished an interview with Peter Lavenda, bless his heart. Oh, yes, uh -huh. And uh, we talked about off-world uh, civilizations. And yes. And I said, you know, Peter, I said, what I'm wondering is if all these uh, religions would carry this stuff off-world with yes. them. Yes. You know, I mean, how to poison the rest of the universe? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Uh, the Vatican, as you know, last year came out and said that it was okay if we ever encounter aliens to baptize them. Oh, Lord. Well, you know, the last time we saw that sort of cultural response yeah. was when the old world discovered the new world, and there were debates on whether or not the Native American Indian populations were even human or not, believe it or not. Oh, I, 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 I know. They, they did have those debates. I know. And when they finally decided, okay, yeah, they're human, <laughs> you know, what, what else could they be, you know? But <laughs> nonetheless, when that subject was determined, well, then, yeah, you know, we'll all march them through a stream and, and, and convert them to Christianity and destroy their culture and burn their books. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. so yeah, I I have visions of a replay on a cosmic scale if, if that oh, were to happen. Oh gosh. Oh my gosh. Well, you know, I have a friend who is Choctaw uh -huh. and um occasionally uh Christian do goodies will come to her door and she says, No, thank you, I'm not a Christian. <gasps> oh, you're not you know, and she says, no, she said, uh, I'm Indian, and I'm very pleased with my faith. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, the biggest thing that Christian missionaries, being from South Dakota, had to explain was why the Sioux Indians believed in a trinity. Yeah. Not having had any any contact <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with Christianity. <laughs> So, you know, but that's my point. It goes back to the fact that this metaphor, mm -hmm. you know, you find trinities from from Hinduism to, to Egypt to Neoplatonism to the Mayans to the Sioux Indians, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason why, as, as we were attempting to show in the book, the reason why is that that just falls out from the mathematics of the metaphor itself once yes. you understand what's, what's being said. Yeah. So, you know, it's not all that surprising. That, that you have this phenomenon in so many disparate cultures around the world. Well, it's amazing. It yeah. truly is. Jennifer. Yeah, it is. It is. You know, uh, it really is amazing when you when you get to right down and, and think about the vast uh, the vast implications of all of this. And and what is all this BS about? Are you saved? Well, I thought that when Jesus Christ did the cross and the crucifixion that that saved people well that's a whole other twist George Ann that we don't really talk about in the book other than to point out that within the evangelical version of Christianity mm -hmm. the the moment of conversion in the macro sense mm -hmm. is 
is the exodus, is the crucifixion, and so on and so forth. In the micro sense, <clears throat> for the individual, it becomes that moment when they surrender themselves to, they surrender their will to the system. They accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. And they have their conversion experience. The, insi- the insidious part of that system is that in most uh in most practice of of that system within the United States and in Canada you have the doctrine that this is tied to something called inter- eternal security once saved always saved yeah and this comes out to out of to a certain extent it comes out of calvinist doctrine yeah that the the individual believer must be certain of their salvation, all right? How can people do that? Well, that's precisely the point. <laughs> you, this is, again, the introduction of that moral schizophrenia into the internal psychic world. Yeah. Because you're, you're forever seeking an emotional certitude that simply cannot ever be there. Oh, my gosh. Just... <laughs> so you end up playing games not only with yourself to convince yourself, yeah. But playing games to convince others that yes, indeed you are. <laughs> oh my God. Oh. And you know this this is one reason that evangelicalism back in in my church days never appealed to me. Yeah. Because number one, it's it's not the system that was in place within early Christianity at all. Yeah. You know, uh, Christianity, like it or not, in its in its first thousand years of existence, was an entirely sacramental religion. Mm-hmm. And and the idea of of modern evangelicalism was just simply foreign to it. But the 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 whole the whole problem, George Ann, is as you say, you can't ever really be certain. Yeah. No. Pay enough money, and the preacher will tell yeah, you. Yeah. Volunteer you enough money, you know, win win more souls for Christ, and that you know that yeah. tells you that you're certain. Oh gee. Oh. So it's you know. <laughs> You know, it, it really is. A, uh, you know, I feel, I feel sorry for people locked in it. Yes. Because I know what they're going through. I really do. I've, I've been there, done that, and oh. uh, I know what they're going through. Oh, Joseph. Yeah, and people that commit suicide over all this. Yes. It, yes. It, it's. It's yes. an unforgivable, uh, terrible thing that that has been promulgated. It, it's it's just oh, yeah. Another question: uh-huh. um, Resurrection mm-hmm. was that part of the early church? Oh yes, definitely, definitely. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which version you look at. If you look at Gnostic versions, they had their own interpretations of what that meant, of course. Mm-hmm. But at some point, yes. Um, as far as as far as Orthodox little O Christianity goes, definitely it's part of it. Um, you know, it's it's in their creeds. Uh, so definitely it's there, and it's certainly there in, in the writings of Paul. Is, so yeah. Is is it in any other? Religion. It is within Judaism, within the, the Pharisaic uh, tradition within Judaism. Oh. Uh, the Sadducees, of course, disputed it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's there. But the the origins of it, I think, lie not so much within those traditions. I think they're. I think a case can be made that they're holdovers of the traditions that Yahwism came out of. Aha. Uh-huh. Aha. Uh-huh. Because it's certainly there within Egyptian uh, yes. Osirian thinking. Yes. Uh, you have similar conceptions in some cases in, in some of the other cultures in that region. So, yeah, I think it's coming from somewhere else. But well, again, that's a very lengthy academic sort of case to investigate. Well, it seems that it would be coming out of Egypt because yeah. Egypt is very old. 
yes. And uh, they did have uh, a concept of resurrection. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they did. And, and you know, Moses himself yeah. is coming out of that tradition. In fact, the name Moses isn't, isn't Hebrew. It's, it's, it's Egyptian. Yeah. And uh, you certainly have that tradition in Egypt. So, yeah, I think I think in these kinds of questions, one has to be very careful because, like I say, to make that case, it would be a very lengthy uh, academic sort of thing, uh, academic sort of study. Um, mm. And, you know, we don't really even talk about that issue in, in the Yahweh book. Yeah. Well, will you in in uh, book part two? <laughs> no. Um, we've got... He was up here yesterday and today, Dr. Hart, and uh, we've been mapping out the next few books in that ebook series. Um, we've got about four to five of them mapped out of kind of how we want to head in this direction. Um, yeah. And we're we're not really concerned so much with the individual doctrines of, of this or that religion. What we're trying to look at and, and do is paint in very, very broad strokes. Yeah. What about baptism, Joseph? When when did that really arise? Is it pre-Christian? Well, yeah, in a certain sense, yes. I mean, you have John the Baptist, and uh, there was a movement within Judaism around that time where baptism became a a kind of a ritual cleansing uh, bath yeah. that arose within certain sects of Judaism. It's, it's strongly believed, and I happen to think that the scholars that believe this uh, are correct, that this was closely tied with, with the Essenes and so on. Yeah. But you have, you have within other religions that are not Yahwist, you certainly have the idea of, of ritual baths, ritual cleansings, and so mm-hmm. on and so forth. <laughs> yes. Well, in the non-Yahwist religions, are there uh, any mentions of resurrection aside from Egypt? Well, like I say, I think you can find similar types of doctrine. They may not call it resurrection. That's why I say it's it's something that merits an academic study. Yeah. You have certain you have certain uh, adumbrations of it within some of the Mesopotamian texts, some of the Hurrian texts. You have quirky versions, if you want to look at it in a very, very peculiar way, yeah. within the Hindu tradition. Uh-huh. Um, but again, they wouldn't call it resurrection. Um, yeah. They they would call it something very different. But sure, you, you, the idea of of life after death is is present in one form or another within most religions. Oh ho! Oh ho! My goodness! Oh. What's 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 unique to the Yahwist version, and particularly the, the the Orthodox Christian version, is that the resurrection is understood to be the resurrection of the body. Yeah. Whatever that means, you know, mm-hmm. in terms of of those doctrines. But uh, within Osirian Egyptian thinking, it's a little bit different, and so on and so forth. It's it, it's a it's a complex question, and it's really not easy to answer without having sit, to sit down and examine all sorts of texts from from all over the world. Yeah, I I can understand. Wow, Joseph. Apocalypse Theater, Volume 1, Yahweh, the Two-Faced God. This book is a must-read, folks. It just is. Um, You're not trying to... um, destroy people's faith. No. You're trying to get them to see things right. um, that they're not seeing. Right. right. And I applaud you for this. Well, thank you. What what we're trying to do is get people to see that you needn't necessarily to believe in God, you you needn't necessarily have to believe in a text or a system. Right. Uh, that's that's really crucial here because, like I say, you've got this metaphor, and it's pretty well present in most ancient cultures. And the clear implication of the metaphor, at least in one interpretation of it, is in some sort of theism. There is, as we point out in in the book, there is an atheistic interpretation of it, hmm. and it is every bit as as reasonable as the theistic one. In fact. 
to really understand the metaphor in all of its implications, you're dealing with a both-and situation rather than an either-or situation. Yeah. So to really understand the uniqueness of it and how the ancients viewed it, there's a reason that the Hindus believe that everything came out of nothing. Yeah. And that to a certain that to a certain extent explains what many people object to within Hinduism. But there is a reason for it. But there's also a reason why so many within the Egyptian or Hermetic or, or kind of Greco Platonic tradition think of it in theistic terms as well. Yeah. They're both looking at the same thing. Mm -hmm. They're just seeing different implications of it. But this is a far cry. This this metaphor is a far cry in either interpretation from what you have with Yahwism. Because with Yahwism, you have, number one, a being claiming to be that no thing, yeah. that creator God. And number two, doing all sorts of horrible stuff. Yeah. Number three, revealing himself to the Hebrews through a specially appointed agent to whom he gives private revelation. Mm -hmm. You see, so the structure is very different than the metaphor, because the metaphor is known to everybody because it's it's really a, a, a kind of a physics, as it were. Yeah. All right? The Yahwist religions say, no, it's not known out there in nature. It's not known within the soul. It's not known within man. And therefore, it can only be known by a special communication from God direct to man oh. through some appointed agent. Yeah. So you see, there's there's an implication right there because... What you're doing implicitly with that step is you are, are replacing, so to speak, reason with revelation. Hmm. My goodness. Yeah, it's it's all of this is huge. Oh yeah, it is gigantic. <laughs> oh. oh my gosh, Joseph. My yeah, it's, gosh. it's 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 huge. I'm surprised that you. Uh, put together the things that you put together in the book, Yahweh, the Two-Faced God, um, so well. I mean, it's just seamless. Well, we worked, you know, we in a certain sense, we didn't write that book in the last couple of months. We wrote it for over 20 years. Yes, yes, I know. Um, and really... We we certainly didn't recapitulate everything that we've talked about in 20 years, Doctor DeHart and I, right. in in a mere 123 pages. Right, right. Um, <laughs> <you know. laughs> but we certainly we certainly talked about you know the self fulfilling nature of prophecy. We certainly talked about the idea of of elites manipulating those expectations for their own political agendas. We've mm -hmm. certainly talked about the nature of, of these kinds of revealed religions as opposed to that metaphor. We've certainly talked about, uh, you know, I remember several discussions of talking about the rise of, of Zionism as a political movement. Yeah. And, you know, he's one of the few people I've been able to talk to in my life about the very, very... Uh, and this will sound totally insane, George Ann, but but the very, very strange and shady cooperation that existed between Zionists and Nazis oh, yeah. prior to and even during World War II. It doesn't sound strange at all, Joseph. Well, in a certain sense it isn't, but in another sense, you know, we've been so conditioned by by the public version of history that we've been taught. Yes. That the idea of such a collaboration to most people will seem or sound absurd. Yeah. But uh, you know, in that fourth chapter in the book, we we lay out a few details. Certainly not all of them. I mean, that that part of the book would have gone on forever had we had we wanted to be academically thorough. We just basically what we did in that chapter is is just tossed out a few details. Some of them very, as you well know, some of them very sensational. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know which one I'm talking about. Yes, I do. <laughs> yep. But um, those details are not known to most people. Mm -hmm. And, again, we're putting them out there to force people to ask the question, why would yeah. two such 
movements that are, on the one hand, so implacably opposed to each other mm-hmm. be in a situation where they're actually cooperating with each other? Well, the British yes. um, are involved in this with the oh, Nazis. Yes. And they're involved in it, the British are involved in it with the Nazis, with the Arabs. Yes, yeah. And yeah, it, they it, they um, inflamed uh, the Arabs. Look at, uh, uh, what is the name, that word, Joseph, of that um, thing that went on in um, Iraq? Uh, the Farhud. Yeah, the Farhud. Um, for thousands of years, those people lived relatively peacefully, yes. and thump, all of a sudden, bang. it was a slaughter. Yeah, bang. Yeah, yeah. There was there was a period where the the Muslim world was, in a certain sense, far more tolerant of other religions within its mix than, say, medieval Western Europe. Um, and you know, we have the opposite impression of Islam now for obvious reasons. But you have to go back and look at, at Muslim history very, very carefully, the, the caliphate and so on and so forth, mm-hmm. to see how they were applying their law. I'm not saying it was rosy by any stretch of the imagination because, mm-hmm. you know, you paid a special tax if you were not Muslim. And, and the whole point of the tax was basically to tax other religions out of existence. Yeah. But that's a far different cry than the Albigensian Crusade where you have you know, the King of France and the papacy, you know, joining forces to wipe out the Albigensians in yeah. <laughs> southern France. <laughs> so, um. you know, uh, the, you know, again, my point is, is that at various times in history, these Yahwisms revert to the, the violent foundations of their religions. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that danger is always and ever present within them. Always. Yes. You know, this is the other point we're trying to make. We may think that we're living in the modern age and that oh. a return to those practices is inconceivable. Well, one of those religions has returned to those inconceivable practices. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if things keep going as they are, the other two are probably not far behind. <laughs> right. 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 Well, you know, up on the guest page, I've got, please read this book. Um, It's a well-written account of over 50,000 children in Canada Uh that were tortured, um, murdered, uh, displaced, uh, starved to death by so-called good Christians. Yeah. and it's very little talked about. Yes, I know. And it's in a PDF file, and I hope people will get that and read that too. Because yeah, that's that's a whole other story. Someday I'm hoping to investigate these yes. uh, these networks of of uh, I don't know how to describe them, Georgia. Oh, it I appears know. to me that there's some sort of worldwide network. That traffics in children for whatever purpose, pedophilia or, yeah. you know, ritual sacrifices and so on and so forth. There's something very, very dark that's been going on for a very long time. Yes. And uh, oftentimes it does it under the guise of religion. Yeah. Other times it doesn't, but uh, I think these things are related phenomena. That's that's my gut instinct. Yeah, mine too. Oh, oh my gosh, Joseph. Well, God bless you. Well, and, thank you. and your co-author well, thank for you. producing, having the courage to produce this book. This is, it is so needed in the world, Joseph. I just can't tell you. Well, thank you. Um, I'm hoping, like I say, I'm hoping we'll be able to get Dr. DeHart uh, up here next week yes. for uh, part two of the interview because I... I think it's important for people to realize that this isn't, you know, this this was a joint effort, and that our yeah. our motivations for writing it, you know, are very similar, but but in some cases, you know, they're they're each unique. And, yeah. Uh, and his his perspective on things is is rather interesting because uh, in his ecclesiastical days, he was a representative of of a Western Christian tradition, uh, Anglicanism. 
Yeah. And I was, of course, in my ecclesiastical days, a representative of, of the Eastern Christian right. <laughs> tradition. So, right. You know, we each bring a, a rather different uh, perspective yes. to all of this. But in the final analysis, you know, we've come to very, very similar conclusions about it in our lives. Mm, my goodness. Well, God bless you both for well, having the you. courage to produce this book, this this wonderfully written book. It is just so timely, Joseph. Thank, well, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you. And everybody, well, thank you. go to GizaDeathStar.com and get a copy of Yahweh, the Two-Faced God. You will be amazed absolutely amazed and help Georgia and out with some donations too folks please oh thank I you I know you're struggling huh yeah I, I are <laughs> yeah we we all are I think oh and I want to uh thank Yuri in Russia for a lovely lovely email thank you Yuri and uh all of you that have sent encouraging emails thank you yes same here and, and thanks to all those people for their prayers and, and yes. uh, donations and support I, I am very very grateful yes me too and Joseph <laughs> I just can't say enough how appreciative I am of this book this, well thank you this is uh, a, it casts a huge light on a lot of dark corners yeah. that need light yeah. on well. them it was it was our pleasure, and uh, like I say, hopefully we'll get Doctor DeHart up here for his contribution to the series too. Oh well, we we'll catch him. <laughs> <laughs> we'll catch him sooner or later. Yeah. And God bless everybody out there that's listening. Good night, everybody.